Hey everyone, welcome to the next part in our DevOps Masterclass, and this is Mastering Git. I really think this is a core capability everybody needs. No matter what you do, the ability to version control the work you're using really is critical. As always, if this is useful, I really do appreciate a like, comment, and share, and hit that bell icon. So what I want to do in this is really go over the basics and really the building blocks of Git. I actually want to talk about how Git works under the covers, which I don't always go into those types of details, but I think for Git, once you actually understand what it is and what it's doing, it makes a lot of the concepts actually a lot easier to understand. Then we'll talk about actually using Git and then some more advanced concepts. Don't forget all of the source code uh, I'm using is in the repo for this class. It's linked in the description below. And make sure this video again is part of the playlist in that repo, there's the whiteboard, the PowerPoint that I'm using. So firstly, why do we even bother about a version control system? Now notice I'm saying version control. You'll hear it called a source control system as well, but maybe we're not dealing with source files. These are not .c files, for example it's maybe some artifact that I still want to work on, collaborate with others, and have different versions of. Now, even as a team of one, if it's just me, I might have multiple versions of the same file. And without some kind of source control system, we get into this really, really ugly place. I know me personally, for example, before version control, I'd kind of, I'd call them names if we actually go and have a look. So let's jump over to here for a second. And if I go and look with kind of without source control, you can see these files that I have over here on the left. So I might have, hey, I've got my initial important file. Well, then I create a important file v2. Well, I added things, then I create a v3 with a feature. Well, then I create my final version as like, oh wait, it wasn't final, there's a new final. Maybe I use subfolders, whatever that might be. I end up doing kind of version control in a really, really ugly way. So version control system will help us because it gives us the capabilities to track the different versions. It lets us have metadata. Hey, I, I can put a comment in, what was the change? I can track who did it, when they did it. I could give it a certain label, a tag. It really helps me track all of the things related to that file. So a version control system is useful even if it's just me. When you start expanding to more than just you, it becomes a necessity. If I'm working as part of a team, I really need a way to collaborate with the other people in a consistent manner to help us bring together data. Now, one thing I will stress from the start, when we start talking about Git, for example, is just using the file system. If that file system is stored on something like my OneDrive and I have a local copy, well, that OneDrive syncs up to the cloud and syncs to other machines. For me on my own, that's probably fine. When I start working with other people, well, I probably need a different way to kind of share that version control system. So what are some of the benefits, the features I expect from a version control system? It's gonna be the source of truth. I don't want everyone having their own copy of a file saying, no, no, mine is the right one, this is the one you should be leveraging. By having a version control system, it becomes a single point of truth for the intellectual property of my project or for my entire organization. It enables collaboration so if I think about the idea that, hey, I have different people working on a solution, maybe some people are working on a bug fix, some people working on a feature, some people working on a new major version, I need a way to kind of bring all that back together and track it. They need to be able to see, hey, the changes that other people have done, but in a very controlled way. If there's a problem, I need to be able to roll back. If a customer has an issue, well, what version are they using? So what version of the artifacts or source code do they have? So this is a key thing that enables actually collaboration, enables DevOps, all those things we're gonna talk about. With features like branches that I'm gonna talk about, 
it enables us to have those different tracks of kind of work going on. It encourages consistency. It encourages a certain way to work, but obviously I still need good process. So you always talk about, remember, the, the people, process, the tools involved. Whatever you pick is going to be a tool, and then we need to use it in the right way. So we need a good process. We need to agree as an organization. This is the approach. This is how we're going to use branches, for example. Um, this is when we're going to check in. We're going to do this daily. This is going to then trigger some continuous integration to test and make sure we're not introducing problems. But it will encourage a level of consistency, but we still need people to follow a process. It's going to give us that full history and immutability. So what that kind of means here is in my version control system, it's going to have the ability to go back and see who did something, what they did, and why they did it. We have that metadata, remember. So it's going to give me that great ability to go back and track and see exactly what changed. It is a strongly version solution. And it's immutable in that, as we'll see, I can't go back and mess with history outside of the actual features that are included. I can't go and hack a file from the past and change it to something else. It, it will break. It will tell, hey, something's gone here. This doesn't match anymore. So it gives me an immutability in terms of, hey, I get this very strict view of the past. If I want to change the past, I have to use the tooling, but it will be very visible that I've actually do that. And it hooks into additional security mechanisms. So if I'm bringing all of my artifacts, my source code, whatever, into some central repository, I can hook into other things. For example, let's say I put it in GitHub. Um, GitHub has these capabilities that would go and say, hey, look, you have a secret. Um, you have an access signature in here. You probably didn't mean to do that. I'm going to flag this, and you can go and do something about it. And there are other types of security I can hook in. Again, we talk about shifting left security earlier and earlier, not, hey, it's in production. Now let's do a security scan. Hey, as we're checking the things in, what can we be doing then to find any security vulnerabilities? Hey, as we're building, hey, we have these dependencies. We should go and fix that. Constantly checking those things. And it gives us this ability to hook into continuous integration, continuous delivery. By having our code constantly checked in, that is what lets us then have things like continuous integration that will trigger maybe nightly, maybe every time I do a commit, every time I do a pull request. We're going to talk about all these terms. That enables me to get that integration. Now, there are really two types of version control system. Centralized. So if I think about centralized, this is not hugely used. This used to be how it was done. Um, when I used to work at Logica, we had a centralized source control system. And I can really think about in a, a centralized world, as the name suggests, there is some central repository. And that has all of the different artifacts, all of the different codes that I might have. And then what happens is, hey, look, if I want to work on a certain project, I check out certain files. Now, they are now locked. I now essentially have a lock on that. And then someone else comes along. Uh, OK, they want to work on that file. So they check out that file, and only they can work on that one. And what the challenge becomes is, well, now someone else comes along and they want to work on that file. They can't because I've got it checked out. They may be able to get a read-only version. But that's really the best that they will be able to do. So the, the challenge we get with this is kind of this whole locking and kind of locking people out to be able to do things. And it's also, I only have the files locally. Let's say this is file four and five. I only have those on my machine. They only have file two. If I was offline, if I was on a plane and I wanted to do some work, I don't have files one or three or four or five on this machine. So there's a kind of a, a challenge around there. So it can really kind of 
stop me being able to do work that I want to do because I kind of only have certain files. The next one we have is distributed. Now we might still have a central copy of the repository, but now the point is everyone who is participating has a copy as well. So that's centralized. If I think about distributed, So, sure, in the distributed, I still have this idea of a copy that's available to all the different people. But now this person on their machine, they actually have the full copy. They have a full copy and they can kind of synchronize. They can pull down changes and push up changes. Likewise, this other person, they also have a complete copy of the entire repo. Now, when you first see that, that may seem kind of scary because I'm all changing the same files at the same time. This is where we have things like branches. This is where we have things like continuous integration. We want to check in daily so we find early if there are problems, if we are having some clash, and we resolve it. So often we see this as kind of this idea of this kind of remote origin, where all the different people will go and sync their changes up to. And this is what we're focusing on. This is Git. And when you hear about things like GitHub and Azure DevOps, well, they are using this methodology. So GitHub, Azure DevOps, Bitbucket, you kind of name it, they're all based on Git. And what that means is my local tool set is just Git. And then they are just kind of a remote origin that I can use for my repository. Now they might add additional capabilities, additional features, but fundamentally it is this. And once again, the key point here is we kind of can synchronize through kind of pull, hey, tell me the changes and push mechanisms. Now, one of the things that obviously you'll see about this is, well, what about conflicts then? Because I can absolutely be changing all of the same files as someone else. This is why we want to kind of do this integrate often. That is a key point. I am not going to make changes for three months and then try and merge it back into the same copy everyone else has. Yes, there'll be a whole bunch of conflicts, there'll be challenges. This tooling gives us the ability to handle those things. But as long as we integrate in often, we'll find those, we can resolve them. Okay, one other thing. You might be looking at this going, that could be a lot of data. Potentially, if it's a really big repo, but most machines today are not struggling with disk space. This space today is by and large pretty cheap. And so it's not a huge problem to have this idea of, hey, I'll have a full copy. And I think of the benefit if I'm on a plane, I can operate on anything I want. We just need good processes around it. So obviously Git is the focus for what we're talking about. This is a free open source distributed version control system. Now free as in Git is free. Things like GitHub and Azure DevOps, if I choose to use those, depending on what parts I use and what levels of service, there might be charges for them. But Git itself is a free open source project. It was basically just using your files and folders on the file system. We're actually going to spend a bit of time looking at that at the start. We want to understand how Git actually works under the covers so you can really not be afraid of it. We can understand what it's doing. It's like, Okay, I get what it is, makes sense. I now understand what the commands do when I execute them. So there's no process running, there's no service. On my local machine, I'm using a command and that just manipulates things on the file system. Obviously, this is what we're gonna focus on. Now, interesting, it was actually created by Linus. Yep, the guy who created Linux. He went and created his own version control system for this. And as I mentioned, 
I mean, this has really become the de facto standard. If you look at pretty much all of the solutions today, including GitHub, Azure DevOps repos, Bitbucket, they are using Git. So it, it really has become um, that standard solution. You'll hear me say repo. Repo is a repository. Kind of use those interchangeably. Nearly all of this is going to be demo. So go and get Git. If you go to this website, git-scm, so on here, you can actually see there's downloads. And for downloads, it's Mac OS, Windows, Linux, and there's sort of a download for Windows. If I go to Linux, for example, it might say, hey, you can do apt-get, install git. So there's different ways to do it. But what I'm basically getting here is git installed on my machine. So that's the kind of the key first point. Now, once you've actually installed git, it should add it to my default path. So if I'm over here, if I open up SysDM, this is obviously Windows, Linux has its own thing, but if I go to advanced environment variables, and if I look at my system path and edit, we can see here, it added C program files git cmd. So that's where it has kind of the git executable. That's the thing we're constantly going to hook into. So I want that in my path, so I can really just type git from anywhere. Now the other thing I really would recommend is VS Code. Now for VS Code, that's kind of linked in the main repository um, for this course, and I've got kind of the downloads for that. But what you're going to do is once I have VS Code, if I actually go and look at my settings, there's kind of one setting you need to do. And the big one here is the git.path. So you're just going to tell it where is the git executable. Once I do that, it really lights up VS Code to now have all of its source control capabilities. So actually, in, now I'm not going to use the VS Code special features. Until right at the end, I'll show it to you. I'm just going to use the command line. But you see this little icon over here? Well, this gives me access to a whole bunch of integrated source control. It will go and track the changes. There are extensions. A really good extension is Git Lens here, which actually adds even more great features around version control. I can see kind of all the, the commits that are going on. I can see branches that are happening as I'm editing my code. And you're, you're going to see this as we kind of go through. If I just click on a line, it has this kind of blame line. You can see it's old me. I made this change. That is the Git lens integrating with the version control and showing me that. So I do recommend using VS Code. I do recommend installing Git lens. It's just going to make these things so much nicer. So that really is kind of a, a key thing we really want to be doing. So go and git git. Um, nearly everything we do is going to be on a local machine. I don't need to go and buy subscriptions. Even when I do a demo of a remote solution, it's still not doing anything you have to pay for. Everything we're going to do today, I can do for zero pennies. So let's actually think about this for a second. And just really quickly, if I think about, well, actually just creating a repo. Now, it's going to be empty, but you'll have a repository. So if we jump back over for a second, over to here. Now, this file, this script.ps1, it's in the part two master git folder of our DevOps repository. And I'm actually going to use this for pretty much everything we do. So you have a full copy of everything I'm going to do. Now, firstly, I can check what version. If I do git dash dash version, I can see down here on the bottom, I'm running the 2.32.0 Windows. Now, any folder can be turned into a repository. So if I just go to CD dollar scratch for a second. And I can just make a directory, make directory, git play one. 
and then just move into that folder. Now that folder right now is completely empty. If I was to actually move over to that, and I've got kind of view hidden folders turned on, you can see it is completely empty. There's nothing in it. If I was to type git in it, it's now turned it into a repository. And it's even telling you, hey look, we initialized an empty repository in a subfolder called .git. And that is the key point of this. And you can see it, it's there. So now I've got this git subfolder, and it's created a bunch of different folders. Now we're going to go into actually what these are later on. But that really is just a key point for this. Now at this point, I could absolutely go and clone. For example, here I could clone the DevOps Masterclass actually into this folder. I could clone a local folder. But I'm not really going to dive into all of these things right now. We're going to go into this in a lot more detail later on. But essentially, I now have a completely empty repository. If I do my git status, well, there's no branch yet, nothing going on. If I just delete that folder and now do a git status again, it's not a repository. That's it. That, that, that is what git fundamentally is. It's all contained in that .git subfolder. So that gives you kind of an idea of that's how easy it is. And then obviously I need to start going and actually adding things into that repository. But that's it. That, that was creating a repo, git space in it. Now obviously you want to do things a bit more interesting than that. But before we start doing things a bit more interesting, there is some initial configuration. I talked about the idea of metadata kind of who did the things. And so before we go any further, there's a few basic configurations we actually want to perform. And so let's actually go and do those and actually see Git in action. So that was it for the PowerPoint. So if we jump over, I can think really that the first things I'm kind of going to be doing is I think about, well, who am I? So there is a set of global, let's just clear the screen for a second. There are a set of global configurations. There's this git config dash dash global dash dash list. So if I actually execute that, we can see I've already populated over here my username and my user email. So these are global. These will apply to any repository I create on this machine. Now to actually set those, I just do get config dash dash global user.name and user.email. Now I could absolutely create dash dash local versions. So if I wanted different values for a different repo, I could do git config dash dash local user.name and use something else. Now there's a whole bunch of other configuration items. I can do a get config dash dash list dash dash show origin. And I can see, hey, where are all these different things actually coming from for my various configurations. So I can see all these different options over here. And there's a whole bunch of them, so I just keep kind of pushing enter through these. So I can see, okay, there's some from, okay, there's user.name John Savile, my default branch, and that's actually now my options and queue to exit out of that. The other setting you've seen me kind of configure here is this init default branch, and I'm calling it main. So obviously there's been a, a lot of changes socially in the world, and its default name used to be master. There is a move to change that to main. So what we can see is I've changed mine here to now be called default branch name is main. So it's really kind of a key point about all of this. So now when I create a repo, it has to have a default branch. This is where all my code just lives by default. And so mine is going to be main. And that's, again, over time, that's going to become the standard anyway. So let's actually dive into this for a second. Let's really think about what is going on in this environment. Now, in Git, as I kind of mentioned already, it's just things on disk. There's no magic going on. Everything is on disk. 
so I can really think about what I'm going to have is a whole set of blob files. So I just have these kind of blobs, blob one. I create another file, I get a blob two. Now I'm going to talk about how it stores these in a second. But every single object ends up being a blob. Um, it is actually a Zlib compressed file, which again I'm going to I'll, I'll talk, draw that out. And what happens is for every single one of these, it generates a hash. Now it's a SHA-1 hash value, which basically based on the content is guaranteed to make it unique. But also if I had the same content in the same files, it would have the same hash value, so it would only actually get stored once. The file name is not part of this. The files are called the hash values. And we're going to see this in a second. I'm going to walk through this actual structure. Now, by using this SHA-1 for the name, it guarantees the name would be unique. It also guarantees I can't change the contents of the file. If I change the contents of the file, it constantly revalidates this SHA-1 hash every time it interacts with it. So if I went into the .git folder and the objects and started messing around with content, well, the next command I run that used that, it would say, this doesn't, it's not integral. I've lost my integrity. So I know someone has messed with it. So I can't just go and play around with things. That SHA-1 hash it's going to generate is constantly being validated at every single interaction. So it's just going to create those on the file. And this is used throughout all of the structures. Now, when I actually create something called kind of a commit, there's no file names on these blobs. So what it actually does is there's another type of object called a tree. And a tree actually has file names. So it might be like, hey, file1.txt. And it uses a pointer to the actual blob on disk that represents file1. And hey, I have file2.txt. And that points to the blob. Again, if they had the same content, they would point to the same blob. And once again, the tree is a hash value name. So once again, I can't go and mess with, oh, okay, I'm changing this to file two, now it points to a different blob. When it gets checked, that would no longer match. So I'm constantly guaranteed that no one is messing around with these hash values. It is an integrity feature. So the tree points to objects on the disk and tells me which file name it actually represents. And then what we have is a commit. So I can think about a commit is a certain point in time snapshot of the entire repository. So this is a key point. When I do a commit in Git, it is the entire contents of the repo. If I've changed one tiny file, it is a complete snapshot of the entire repository every single time I do a commit. But remember, how do we store things? We store them as these SHA-1 hashes as blobs. So if only one file changed and nothing else had, while well, not restoring everything again, these have not changed. The tree would just point to the existing blobs. I'm not really wasting a whole amount of things. So when I do that a commit, that point in time, well, what it actually does is that commit points to a certain tree that represents the state of the files that are in that point in time. Then it has some metadata. It has a whole bunch of things like author, creator, date, etc., etc. And then it actually links to a parent. Now, if it's the first commit, it won't have a parent. But if I already have things and then I do another commit, well, there's another commit object up here and it would point to its parent. This commit is also a SHA-1 hash for its name. So I can't mess with this either. So a SHA-1 hash points to a SHA-1 hash, which points to SHA-1 hashes. I can't mess with anything in the history. It points to the SHA-1 hash of the parent. Why? I can't mess with any of these things. All of these things essentially are used to check the integrity, not simply security, but it helps ensure the integrity of everything I'm doing. I know 
nothing really could have messed with this because of the SHA-1 hash. So everything we've done so far is a SHA-1 hash. So it's really helping make sure the integrity of this is rock solid. And this is fundamentally Git. Everything else we do is based on this concept. Everything is an object on the file system. And that really is the key point. When we talk about branches, a branch is nothing more than a pointer to a certain commit. That, that's really all that's happening. And we're going to walk through all of these different things. So they're the objects. Let's actually see this in action. So remember what happened. We did git init. Now when we did git init, remember what did it do? Well, it created a dot git subfolder. Now what it actually created under there was a whole bunch of different things, but one of them was an objects folder, which currently is going to be empty. But it's going to store all of the different things actually under that objects. Now there are some other structures as well, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. But let's start actually populating this. So let's jump over and we'll start with, okay, so we already did our git init. So we did our git init command, but remember we deleted the folder, so I'm going to run git init again. So now it's created that dot git folder. So if I look at my dot git, I can look at my objects, and there's just an info and a pack folder. But it's basically empty at this point. Because my, my repository is empty, there's no objects to actually store. So let's actually give it something that I want to store. So I'm going to create a file. I'm going to create a file called test file. And I'm just going to say, this is a quick test, and save it. Now remember, I'm saving this to my current directory, which is kind of that parent folder to the .git. Now, I'm going to actually run .git add. Now what I'm going to do is quickly shrink this over a little bit. So I want you to be able to see at the same time kind of what is happening over here. So let's just organize that. Okay. So right now, they're the folders. And what we're going to do super quick is I'm going to run git add dot. Now what git add dot does is basically say, hey, add everything that's not currently being tracked or that's changed. So if I do git add dot, keep an eye on this right hand folder. Now it's created a folder called 43. And inside there, there's this just 38 character name. So that's kind of weird. So what has it done? So at this point, the way it works is this objects folder contains all of the blobs. So I can think about in the objects, it has all of the blobs. All of these SHA-1 hashes are 40 characters. Now, what it actually does is it organizes those into subfolders. So it creates a whole bunch of subfolders that are the first two characters of that 40 character SHA value. So then the next one, it'll create a different two first characters. And then what it does inside those is it puts the, the blob. So then it has a 38 character blob. Actually, blob's not the right word. I'm not going to say blob here. We'll just say object, because other things kind of get put in these as well. And that kind of repeats around. So what is this, this two character? Why bother? Well, essentially, this is just sharding. Sharding is where I distribute data in some way. So it's distributing the hashes. Instead of having every hash in one giant folder, <clears throat> hey, we're going to break it up a little bit. We'll take the first two characters, make that subfolder. So then every hash that has the same first two characters is in one subfolder, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a way to actually go and separate out the actual content. So then there'd be another 38 character object that shared the first two characters. So in total, it's a 40 character name. First two characters of the folder, next 38, the actual name of the object. So that's what it did. It created that object that represents the content of that actual file. So it's sharding out the objects. 
Okay, so that, that makes sense. That's how it's actually storing it on the disk. So if we jump back over, that's not a commit yet though. So what we want to do now, let me kind of open up that files again. If we look at get status, what we can see is, hey, look, I've got a new file that has not yet been committed, this test file too. So, so far, all we've done is create that blob. I can even look at the difference between staged and commit, git diff dash dash cached, and now I can see there's my file, my content over there. What I'm going to do now is commit it. So by doing a commit, what do we think a commit is going to do? Remember, a commit points to a tree, which points to the blob. This is going to create two objects. It's going to create the tree, and it's going to create the commit. So I'm expecting to see, unless by some huge coincidence they have the same first two characters, two new subfolders actually created. So let's do my first commit. And right, we see two new, well, zero, zero, that's a pretty big coincidence. We see zero, zero, and A5 actually created. So what it has now actually gone ahead and done is it's created a tree object and it's created a commit object. Both of them just SHA-1 files that have got written somewhere based on the name. So some of these are blobs, some of these are trees. And remember, all of these are actually just stored as these kind of zlib compressed files, which means I can't just type them out. It's this zlib, so it's trying to do this compression to actually help me with what we're doing. So it's going ahead and this is how it's storing the actual content. How do we know that? Well, we can actually go and look at it. So what it has given me over here, so I'm not going to worry anymore about that file system, we kind of see those get created. So it told me something. It actually told me, hey look, a commit. A58784. So I would expect to see an A5 actual subfolder. So there it is. One of the subfolders is called A5, the first two characters. And then the rest of the characters, 87, yep, 87842. So I can see it's gone ahead and created the object. We can actually look at those. Now I can look at the full commit by doing git log. And it's actually showing me that full commit ID, A587, that huge character which is obviously the same as the subfolder and then that name. I can see the author and the date and my commit message. So there's that metadata. Now using git space cat dash file, I can actually look at the type of what this is. Now I don't have to type out the whole 40 characters. What we can actually do is we have to type enough characters so that it's unique. So in this case, I don't have many. I could probably just copy the first five or I'll say seven, it just has to be unique. So I could say git cat file, I want to know what the type is, the first whatever number, seven characters of the commit. And it's telling me it is a commit. I can actually look at it. Instead of doing dash t for type, I can say actually look, show me the content. So interesting. So yes, it's pointing to the 40 character hash of a tree and it's telling me the author and the committer. There's no parent because this is the first ever commit. And then it has my metadata comment. So let's have a look at the tree. So again, we'll just take the first number of characters. Notice no, it's 006E, which represents that 00 folder, the next 38 characters. So let's look at this one. So let's look at the type of this. So what do we expect this to be? Well, we expect this to be a tree, which it is. And then we can look at the content. There's our file name. So notice it's pointing to the blob, which is the content. And this is where it says, hey, this is testfile.txt. That's where we start linking the things together. And then finally, I could just actually go and look at the blob itself. Once again, I could do the type and it's just gonna tell me it's a blob. I can look at the content and there's my message. So we can see all those things just kind of linking together there, showing me, hey, the commit, which links to the type, 
sorry, to the tree, which links to the various blobs. Now let's prove a point. I have a file, remember, my test file. I'm going to copy it to be test file 2. So now I have two files that have exactly the same content. Let's do an add. Okay. I look at my status. There's a file I've not committed. Let's do a new commit. Now when we do a new commit, well actually before we do the commit, did we get a new subfolder? No, we still have three. Why didn't we get a new one? Test file 2 has the same content as test file 1. It goes and generates the SHA-1 hash and says, I have this already. There's nothing to store. But when I do my commit, it has to create a new tree and a new commit object. So if I run this, now we have five. So we have something new for the commit and something new for the tree. And it shows us that. It's like, okay, well, here's our new commit ID. So this time we'll just speed this up a little bit. We're not going to look at the type again. Let's just look at it. Now notice also what we have this time. It points to a different tree, but it also now has a parent because it's the second commit. It has a parent, so we get a chain so we can actually see the tracking. That's how all the tracking works. There's no mystical other file going on in any of these things. The way we get this change history is the commit points to its parent, and we can then follow the chain up. There's not some other special thing that shows me what's going on. This is the key. This gives us the chain. And because of all these SHA-1 hashes, I can't just go and change something behind the scenes because the SHA-1 hash wouldn't match. It's that integrity feature. So now we've actually done another commit, so we've got some new objects. Let's just finish this and prove that point. So that was the commit. If I now look at the tree, and again, remember, just enough characters so that it's unique, what we're expecting to see is two different file names pointing to the same blob, which is exactly what we have. Same content, same blob. So it's being very efficient with actually how we're storing the space within there. Now I'm going to create something now as a nicer way to look at things. So this is this git log, one line, graph, decorate all. So what it does, it gives me kind of a log of everything that's happening. It draws it as a graphical representation. It does it these pretty one line abbreviated comments, shows me heads and pointers, and it shows me all the commits in the history of any branch. So I'm gonna use this over and over again. If I run it now, you can see this nice kind of history saying, hey, yeah, I had this initial commit, and then we had this second commit, and this head main is pointing to that. Head main is that second commit. So let's just for a really quick second talk about, well, what is that kind of thing that I'm talking about? What is this head main thing that I'm leveraging? So I'm obviously working on something. How does it know which commit I'm working on? So in addition to these objects, I have a whole set, remember these two characters, there's also a kind of references folder. And under this, we have a number of heads. And under here, for me, there's a file main. I have one of these for each of my branches. But then how does it know which branch I'm working on? Well, what we also have under here is a file called head. And the way it works is my head will point to a certain reference, i.e. the branch. Again, we're going to talk a lot more about this later on. But in this case, it's called main. That's my default branch. And this points to... the hash of a certain commit. That's all any of this is. When I start talking about branches, a branch is just a reference to a certain commit ID. How does it know what I'm working on? Well, I have a pointer to a particular reference, which just points to that commit ID. And we can see these. So if we jump back over again, and this is kind of a real key thing to understand, because everything else gets honestly pretty clear. 
So if we go back to our kind of file system view for a second. So firstly, I can go to my references. And we can see here we've got our heads, and there's main. If I open that with code, it's just a hash. And what is that hash? Hey, look, it's the hash of my last commit. That's all it is. Nothing special. It's just that. And you don't worry about security. Because it, what, what can I hack it? I'm not changing any code. I'm just changing what does on my machine this file point to. So that's main. And then if I look, I have this head. If I look at what is my head file, I'm pointing to a certain reference. So that's how I know what I'm working on. I'm working on the branch that my head is referencing, and the branch is nothing more than pointing to a particular commit ID. That is it. There's really nothing else going on. There's no mystical things happening behind the scenes. That's how all of this is functioning. If we understand that, everything else we're going to do with Git actually is not that complicated. So we think about Git is storing objects as 40 character SHA hashes. It just shards them over two character subfolders. We have a tree which assigns kind of the names to actually which blob represents that file at that moment in time because the commit references a tree. Commits form a chain by referencing the parent. They're all SHA-1 hashes, they're all immutable. The commit is a complete copy of the entire repository every single time. Everything. But again, I'm not wasting space. The blobs only get stored if there's a change when I add them to kind of that staging. The commits have that metadata, and our branch is nothing more than a pointer to a commit. What am I working on? Is pointed to by head. So that's how it works underneath. That's it. Nothing else we do is any more complicated than that. Now it's just using those things to actually do stuff. So let's actually now use it. Let's do a few more interesting things. And we already staged things and we already committed things. We've already done that in our plan. But let's really dive in and understand even more, well, what did we actually do? We did this weird add thing, then we did a commit thing. What were those things actually doing? So there's actually really three spaces we think about when I'm dealing with Git. I can think about, there is the repository. So I can actually think about, okay, we have the repo itself. And this kind of includes the full history. I can go and see all that. Everything under the Git folder, all of this is the repository. That's, that's fundamentally what we're doing here. So there's nothing else. There's no other registry or daemon. That is the repo. Everything is stored on this dot .git. If I delete the Git folder, I've wiped it all away. This is what enables us to collaborate. We might replicate this to somewhere else that other people can then go and fetch. Now then also, I, as kind of the human being, I want to be able to work somewhere. I don't work well with blobs and stuff like that. So I have this working directory. So I have this working directory that I see as the file system. So this to me would be kind of the parent to the .git folder, I actually see kind of file.txt. So that's my working directory where I can interact and I can do things. Now the challenge is, I might be working on a whole bunch of things. I don't want all of those things to go into the next commit. I want to be able to stage specific things. So in between these two, we have the idea of stage, uh, also called index. And that's where I can go and put things to say, hey, my next commit, this is what I want you to take. 
so I can add things to staging that I want to put into my next commit. It helps me organize so I can have some things and not other things. When we stage them, i.e. we do the add, that is when they get that blob created. So I can really think about, okay, to move to here, that is the whole get, add, and then kind of file or files or dot. To get to staging to the repo, that's where I do kind of the get, commit, and then M, and some comment. That moves it from staging to the repo. So let's kind of see that again. So remember, now what I'm gonna do super quickly is I'm gonna create a function called get graph. Now remember that get log command I showed, one line graph decorate? I'm just gonna create a function for that. It means I can just run get graph in future and it does this nice single view of the commit. So I'm gonna use that over and over again. Now if you wanted to, you could add this to your profile. And I've got some other commands here so you could set the initial branch name actually when you create um, your new repo when you do the git in it. But once again, just to confirm those different steps. So I could edit the file. This is a quick test, line two, and I can save that. Now from here, I can add test file. So what that does is it stages it. So by doing the get add, if I look at get status, you have changes to be committed. So what I have at this point is by doing the get add, I've staged it. I said, look, when I do my next commit, these are the things I want included in the actual commit. And then my next thing I'm gonna do is actually, now I could add other files, I could carry on staging more and more things. And then when I'm ready, when I've got staging complete, now I want to perform that commit, well now I would actually go in, and at this point, I could say, okay, Oh, let's create a third file, just to show you the differences. If I do a get status, now I've got kind of a file that's untracked and a file that's waiting to be committed. So if I now do a get commit dash M and do a get status, I've just got one file that's currently waiting to be committed. But if I do my get graph command, if I type it correctly, you can see, hey, I've moved up, my main branch has moved up a commit, and that's where my head is pointing to. If I do my get status again, I've just got this one untracked file. I can actually look at all of the details. If I do a get log dash P, it'll actually show me the differences between the various files. So I can see all the different things that changed, see all my commits, I can really see everything that's going on. I can see all the different detail. I can even look at the differences between specific commits. So there's a git diff commit commit, so dot dot commit. So if I do my get graph again, and what I could do at this point is I could say, hey, git diff. So let's say the difference between this commit ID, this first one, dot dot, the commit ID of this one. And it's showing me the differences between my first and kind of my last commit. So I, I have that information. So what that is doing, remember, is if I looked over here, remember, I have kind of multiple commits. Well, if I use this kind of git diff hash dot dot hash, I can tell it, hey, show me the differences between the commit IDs that I actually specify. So I'm telling it, hey, give me the kind of that information that I want to know. Carrying on. So that's that basic interaction of what we're doing. That makes sense, we're adding them, we want to be part of the next commit. Now, 
I just did a diff between two commits, but there's other types of diff I can actually see. So let's do my get status again. So get status is a super useful command. You might find yourself constantly typing that. It's showing me, hey, you have untracked files. So let's add test file three. So now it's staged. If I do my get status again, it would be part of the next commit. Now I'm going to change test file. Uh, now I do line three. Save that. Do a get status. So now I've got a file that's in my working directory. Remember, we've got those different levels. So I have a file in my working directory that's not been staged. And I have a file in stage that has not been committed. That's my current status on the system. Now what I want to do is actually look at those. So here, if I do a git diff dash dash cached, so what this command is going to do, this is showing me the difference between the current commit in the repo and what is staged. So that's git diff dash dash cached. So as we look at these different types of command I can do, to see the differences between them, between these git diff dash dash cached. And you'll also see, I think you can do dash dash staged, which is just uh, another command, but it's, it's basically doing exactly the same thing. So to see the difference between staged and the last commit in the repo, git diff dash dash cached. Now, to see the difference between working, i.e. my file system, and staged is just git diff. So here, it's just saying, hey, you've added kind of line three. So I, I can see that in there with that. So from this point over here, I'm that. So what, it, what is that command doing? So this is between these. So that is just git diff. What about if I want to see the difference between what's in my working and what's in the repo? Well, between these, I can do git diff and its head. Remember what is head? Head is just a pointer to the branch, which is to the latest commit. So I'm saying the difference between my working and the latest commit. And if I go and do that as well, we jump over. Here, if I do git diff head, it's the sum basically of the above two. So I can kind of see both of those things, test file three and the test file. So I've really kind of summed those differences all together. What about if I want to remove things? Maybe I've put something into staging and I'm like, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I actually want to get it out of it. I can actually do the git rm command to remove something from staging. So here, let's create a test file four. So if I go into here, I'm going to create test file four. Actually, before we do that, let's clean up a little bit. Let's do git status. Let's just do a git add dot git commit m clean. I would put a more useful comment. Git status. So I'm clean right now, I get graph, I now have four commits. Remember it's moved up again, it's got all those files. So let's create a new file, test file four, testing, save it. Just by the way, if we actually looked now in our get folder and our objects, because we've done lots of commits and lots of trees and lots of blobs, we have more and more of those subfolders because it, it's sharding the data across them. Let's add test file four. And then what we're going to do now is I'm going to commit adding it. So that's now actually committed it to the repo. 
Now, what if I actually want to remove the file? If I do get rm test file 4, it's going to essentially stage the delete of the file. So remove test file 4. So get status, I've deleted test file 4. If I do ls, it's actually deleted it from my local file system as well. And now if I actually do a commit, it will actually now remove it from that tree that gets created. So that's actually removing a file. So what am I saying here is, look, there's a file that I have I actually want to delete. So what I can actually do is with the kind of the get rm command, I'm staging I want to remove kind of a file and it will remove it kind of from here as well. And then when I do the commit, it will remove it from the next actual tree, the next commit. So I can remove things from the repo as well. Now the history will still have it in the previous commits, the, the pr previous trees, but that's how I can actually remove. Now I could also just delete it from here and then do a get add dot and it will see it's gone and it will do the delete that way. So I can also just do a get remove. Um, what about cleaning things up? Um, what about actually, I've put something in staging, but now actually, hey, I've changed my mind. I don't want it in staging anymore. I want to kind of reset where things might be. Maybe bring down the last commit. I've done something in my working directory. Uh, I don't want that there anymore. So there are ways I can actually kind of go back and bring things back or remove things from the staging. So let's kind of take a little look at those. So if we jump over, what I want to do now is kind of clean some things up. So firstly, I can do get reset. So get reset is actually doing dash dash mixed by default. So this is basically going to unstage anything. Now what it is not doing is changing anything in my working directory. So let's clear this for a second. And let's just make a change. So let's code test file.txt. We'll add a line four and save it. So now we'll do a get add dot, get status. So I've staged it. It's in the staged area. If I do git reset, and now do a get status, it's not in staged anymore. Now it has changes not staged for commit, but the change is still there in my local file. It's just, I would have to restage it. So git reset, what it's actually doing behind the scenes it's actually making my staged folder match the last commit. So if I think about this picture here, if I want to make my staging actually map, I want to undo everything I've done, well, I can do get reset. So get reset makes staging match the last commit, i.e. a clean state. I could also do um, and we'll see this, let's jump over. So I can also do a get reset dash dash hard. This would also change the working directory. So if I do a get reset dash dash hard, and now look at my test file. My line four's gone. So I've now essentially reset to the last commit. So realize, just be careful on that. That could be a dangerous one. <laughs> now I'm essentially, if I, if I haven't got that work anywhere, I have now lost work. I've reset it back to the last commit. Now there's things I can do in terms of stashing things and modifying things. So there are things I can have, but just be aware and be careful. I'm essentially now bringing that back 
into making my working directory match that as well. Now, instead of maybe having to bring back everything from stage to match the last commit, I can be more individual. So I can reset individual files. So let's change test file again, um, a new line four. And let's add that to staging again. But I've got my status, there's a file waiting to be committed. I can do git restore dash dash staged from the last commit, but do not change working. So git restore dash dash staged says update staged with the version from the last commit. So my git status will now show that file is unstaged again. I could also restore my working from the staged. So I've reset staged. I could actually now restore that to my working folder. So git restore test file. And now if I look at my test file, it's gone. So now I've actually gone back another. Now also I've got here, hey look, you could restore to stage and working by doing dash dash stage dash dash work tree in one. And this is kind of showing me, hey, the full version is, I'm telling it the source, but source equals head is the default anyway. So I don't have to do that. So this is more about bringing things back. So hey, I can do a git reset. I can do a git restore dash dash staged file going to bring it back from there. I can also do a git restore file to kind of bring it back that way to bring the working in line. So basically there's a whole bunch of different things we can do to move things around but it's really just interacting with those different levels. Hey I've I've done something I didn't mean to. Hey, I've edited a file in my working directory. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. I just want to go back to last commit. Yeah, I can do that thing. I want to go back to, remember stage is typically going to match my last commit unless I've staged things for change. So bringing things from a stage typically will be what was ever in the last commit unless I've already prepared something that I'm about to put in to my next commit. So that's kind of moving things around. But remember, all we're really doing is manipulating hey, the, the, the blobs or changing things in my working directory. But don't ever panic. There's nothing really in Git that there's not a command to clean it up. Hey, I've staged something I didn't want to. Uh, hey, I can reset stage back to the last commit. Or I can restore individual files that I've staged to the last commit. Or I can restore everything. If I want to delete a file in my next commit, hey, I can just do a get remove, which will stage a deletion, and then commit that, and it will remove it. So it's very easy to really kind of interact and modify those various things. There's never anything you're going to get in some terrible state for the most part. It, it seems intimidating, so you realize, hey, I'm just really moving different things around. That's, that's all we're doing. Now, quite a few times I've talked about a branch. And remember, what is a branch? A branch is just a name that is a reference to a commit. As I do new commits, it references the newest commit in that chain. Because when I do a new commit, hey, it has a parent link to the commit before it. So a branch is nothing more than a reference to a commit ID. That's it. When I do a commit, it moves with it. I am working on a certain branch at any one moment in time. That is head. So head just points to the reference, which points to the commit. Remember that, that there's nothing more complicated to it than those things. So if I have all those things together for a second, so I can think, okay, a commit get out the gold pen. Someone commented there, oh, you know, it's gets serious if I bring out the gold pen. So I have a commit. Remember the commit just is a 40 character hash. When I do a new commit, 
it creates a new 40 character hash and it has that parent that points to the commit before it. And then I do another commit, it's a new hash <coughs> that points to the parent before it. And it points to a tree which points to the blobs. We have all of those various things, remember. But that's all we're doing as part of this. So we just get this chain and what's happening is, hey, if this was called main, there's a reference that points to the commit ID. And then there's a head which points to the reference. As I do a new commit, hey, I'm going to do a commit, creates a new hash, references the parent, all that happens is this moves along. That's it. That, that's everything that's happening as I do those things. So I do the commits, creates a new commit, pointing to a new tree, pointing to the blobs, moves the chain along. And we see that, the git graph, remember that command we ran, looking at the git graph, really kind of showed exactly that. So if we do a git log, I can see the detail of all of the various commits I've done. Quite a lot to it, all these changes. I like git graph. So there we go. Look, all these different commits we have now. What about if you want to undo a commit? I've done a commit. I didn't mean to. So I committed saying I don't want it in there anymore. Well, what's a commit? Uh, it's, it's a hash and a tree. But really, to be part of a branch, it's wherever the branch is pointing to. So if I want to basically remove a commit from history, I can't edit this. It's, it's immutable. It's that SHA. But what I can absolutely do is I can say, do you know what? I don't want that there. I can say git reset. And what am I doing? I want to move this over. Now remember, head points to my current branch. I want to go back one. I want to go back one. Soft. Now soft means I'm not going to update my working directory or anything else. Doesn't change staging, doesn't change working. So if I do a git reset, what it's going to do is move this back. So now it's here. So this little kind of tilde there means go back one generation. If I did two, it would go back two. So now this wouldn't point there anymore. And nothing, remember, nothing references that way. As soon as I move my pointer to now point to this one before, nothing ever references this. This essentially is just floating out there. There's nothing using it. So it's actually kind of dead at this point. So when I run these commands, if I do that dash dash soft, it only influences the actual repo level. Remember, we have kind of the repo. So let's just draw that out. We have the idea of kind of the repo. We have stage. And we have working directory. We have those three levels. So a git reset head, dash dash soft, just moves the pointer back actually on the repo. So if we go and look at that as an example, so run my git graph again. So this is where head and my main is currently pointing to this commit. Now what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to reset head kind of tilde one. Git graph. I've just moved up one. Now I'm pointing to C25, which used to be the one below head. So we can see here, this used to be head. Remove test file four. Now, if I actually go, it's adding 
test file four. So we've essentially moved back one. But it didn't change staging. So as far as staging is concerned, what is in the staging is, hey, look, you've set up a deletion, deleted test file four that you've not committed. So staging still has that change. If I was to look at my file system, I do not have test file four. Now I don't have to do that kind of head tilde one. I could actually reset back directly to the hash ID. I just did head tilde one because it was easier to actually work. Now I can also reset staging. Now notice what's happening. Git reset dash dash mixed. We have seen this before. Earlier on, I talked about resetting staging. And I said, we're going to copy from the repo, git reset, and it wiped away staging. Well, if I just do git reset, remember I said dash dash mixed was the default. If I don't specify it like a previous commit, it's just going to do the current one. So I'm not actually moving it backwards, but I'm saying reset staging as well. So essentially over here, if I do dash dash mixed, it's also pulling that change down into staging. Now I could do git reset head tilde one, dash dash mixed, and it would go back at the same time and update staging. Likewise, I can do dash dash hard, which will also bring it all the way down to the working directory as well. So I can pick how far I want to kind of revert things. So maybe I committed something and I, I wasn't ready. I didn't mean to commit that yet. So if I just do a get dash dash soft, it moves the commit back, but it leaves my working and, my, and staging alone so I can modify whatever I need to get and commit again. If I want to bring staging back as well, hey, I can do dash dash mixed to bring back staging also to match the new commit that I want. If I don't specify a new commit hash, it's just leaving it where it is here. And in this case, it's just now making staging look like that last commit. So I can do kind of clever things if I don't actually roll back other parts of it. So that's all we're doing here. But I can manipulate those three different levels. So dash dash soft, I'm telling it a new commit ID that I want the pointer to now reference. These now essentially become orphaned away. Eventually they'll get garbage collected. Dash dash mixed, also update staging with whatever I point to. Head one, could be the current one, whatever. Dash dash hard, bring it back to my working directory as well. Potentially there, I might lose work. So you wanna be kind of careful with the dash dash hard. So here is my kind of get status or different things. So if I do mixed and staged after reset, if I do my get status. So notice now what it does. It knows, hey, look, you deleted it from your current folder, but it's not staged. This deleted test file four. If I also now did a reset hard, it actually brought test file four back on my local file system. It's rolled back staging and working to what currently the head points to. So I've now reset all of them. And again, I can do them all in one go. If I went back another one, so if I do my get graph, Remember the last thing I did was added test file four. If I do a get reset, now I'm saying, hey, dash dash hard, so and staging and working, I wanna go back another one. Let's go back one generation, so that should be clean. If I run this command, now I point to clean, and there's nothing staged. And if I look, test file four is gone because now I've gone back past the commit where I actually had that file existed. Now all those other ones, 
are now kind of sitting out there, they'll eventually be garbage collected up. Okay, so that's kind of a, a, a cool key point. We're going down the different levels. Before we talk about more advanced kind of branching and other things, sometimes I'm going to have a certain version or thing that I just want a point in reference. And what I can actually do is create a tag. Now remember my head, remember it just it points to a commit. So if I can actually do, hey, what is the type of head? Well, head is just a commit. Remember, head points to the reference, which points to the commit. If I look at the content, head just points to my last commit. Clean. I can see it kind of down here. A tag is a way for me to create something, and by default, at my current location. So I can do git tag v1.0.0. If I create that, look at my graph, I now have a tag where head currently points to. I could also add a tag to a previous commit. So I could actually take the hash ID here, and I could do git tag v0.9.1. I could also add it to like two versions back. Remember, I can always use that head. Hey, let's go back two versions. And I might call that um, 9.0. If I do my get graph, and I've got these little tags. Now these will last kind of forever. I've now tagged those various things. And what's nice about this is I can list my tags. So a tag is a great way to reference a particular commit. I can use it like any reference. Hey, show me version 1.0.0. There we go. I can absolutely see that thing. It makes it easy to view. I can actually go and have that. Now that is called a lightweight tag. That tag itself has no separate metadata. It is it's nothing really more than a reference. There's also an annotated type. Now an annotated type lets me actually add, for example, a message. So here I can add an annotated type and give it an actual comment. So if I go, let's look at my get graph again. What one don't I actually have a tag? And I could uh, give multiple tags, but let's just pick our first ever one. So if I just put in that hash there and run that line, I've now added that. And what I can do now, so let's just do a git graph again. So they've all got these little tags now. Now the interesting thing that's now going to happen is I can show it. But notice a little bit of a difference. When I do a get show on the tag, there's this initial information now showed. The tag shows as an object, and then it shows the commit object. So that's not what we had with the first one. The first one just showed the commit message. And the reason for that is if we look at the type of an annotated tag, it's a type of a tag. If I look at a lightweight tag, it's just a reference to the commit. So it's just a way I can give like a head. There's other things I can do with annotated tags. There are things like some signing things I can do. So there, there's a whole series of other capabilities that I, I may want to do depending on what I'm actually working with. A lot of times we'll use the lightweight tag, but realize, hey, uh, there is this more powerful annotated type. If I was using a remote origin, just to be aware, a remote origin, tags are not copied to it by default. So I would actually have to go and push the tag. So get push dash dash tag will push tags to some remote origin. Uh, we'll actually cover that later on. So let's actually talk about these remote origins for a second. Um, very often, even if it was just me on my own, I probably want a remote copy of my repo. 
Now I can have them as private, doesn't mean I have to share it with anyone, but it's really the idea that, hey, um, scroll up here, have a second. Yes, I have my copy of my repo. But if I want to maybe let other people even contribute it, or just for, for safety's sake, I might absolutely want a copy of my repo up in some other service. It, again, it could be GitHub, Azure DevOps, it doesn't matter. So what we'll actually do for our repo, we set that copy as a remote. Now the common naming is remote origin. It doesn't have to be called origin. It's just the standard name for, hey, if I've kind of got a copy of another repo, it's the origin. So we'll call it, it's a remote from us, and it's called origin. Now this happens automatically. If I perform a clone, so there's a public, or it doesn't have to be public, there's a repo somewhere, and I do a get clone, it will automatically be set as the remote origin. Or if I create a repo and then go and add like an empty remote repo that I want to set as the origin, I can do kind of a get remote add. And at that point, I would actually go, sorry, remote origin add. Whoops. I have to give it the name that I want it to be called origin add. And then the kind of the URL or the location doesn't have to be URL of what I want. So now I kind of establish this relationship and there's kind of a, another option which I talk about later on. Now when I do these things, when I use these repos, then there's various actions I can do to kind of push and pull them to actually synchronize that various data. And we're gonna look actually into that. Now I'm not gonna go into the detail on this now. Realize if I'm using things like GitHub, and I want to push to it, well, that needs to be an authenticated action. So GitHub has a whole set of different ways to authenticate. Azure DevOps has its ways to authenticate. Maybe it pops open a browser and I authenticate once and then it stores that. Maybe I create kind of a uh, access token and it uses that and it can store that in kind of for Windows or WinCred. There's different options to configure how I authenticate. Bitbucket, Azure DevOps, GitHub, will have great docs to walk you through that. I really wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, Git actually has a Git credential manager now. For the most part, we'll actually probably leverage that. But what we'll do just super quick is let's actually kind of look at the remote origin side of this. So if we jump over, First thing I can just show you, so if I jump over to my DevOps Masterclass folder for a second, if I do a get remote dash V, I can see, hey look, yeah, there's this GitHub John the Brit DevOps MC dot git is my default for fetch and push. I can see I called it origin for both, and I can kind of see that URL that I'm actually specifying for that. So let's jump back over to my, my play around. And right now you can see I don't have any remotes. Now at this point, it, it's super easy. If I go to, here's GitHub, I can go to my repositories, and I can create a new repo. So I'll just call it git play one. I'm gonna make it a private repo. I'm not gonna put anything in it. I'm just gonna say create repository. And you can do this for free. Now, it's given me things that I can do, and what it's actually saying is, hey, look, you could push an existing repository from the command line. It's given me the two commands I need, git remote add origin, and then git push dash u, which sets up a relationship in the future so I can do a parameterless push and pull. I don't need to do the git branch dash m main, because my branch is already called main, but it's telling me hey, these are the commands you're actually going to need to run. So if I jump over, so here I can do my get remote add origin from here. So, okay, let's add my origin, get remote, get graph, 
Currently, I don't seem to know anything about any remote kind of branches. Well, I'm going to push origin my main branch. So I've now actually pushed. So what did I do? Originally, I added that as an origin, but there was no content yet. So now I've actually pushed to it the content and I'm linking up, hey, main. So now if I do my get remote again, yep, so now I've got it set up for fetch and push. It's set up for this one. Now if I was to look in that repo, if I refresh, it has my content. So it's got the full history, it's got all the commits. It's a full copy of that. But there's no tags. Well, I have to push the tags. Get push dash dash tag. And because I did the dash u, it set up a parameterless push and pull. So now I can just do get push dash dash tag. It's pushed up the tags. Now if I refresh, it knows about four tags. And they're all there. So I added a remote to my existing repo. It has the full code, it has the full repository. So we now have this full kind of status between these. But they're not directly connected through any kind of mystical, magical way that's going on. I constantly have to kind of bring these things into sync. So let's, let's actually think about this for a second, what we've done. So what I had, if I think about those locations, so on my machine, I had a bunch of commits. Oops, let's do a different color, don't like that. Let's go back to blue. I had a bunch of commits. I'm not gonna draw them all. Let's say I had three commits. I had that. Up in the sky, it didn't know anything. Now, I had my branch main, which was referenced by the head. What we did, remember, is we did the git push. When I did that git push, it then populated the other repo with a copy. So it now matched. I had the same thing. And once again, it had kind of its main. It has a head as well, so new people that clone know which branch is kind of the default. Um, that's kind of the idea around that. Now, in terms of what's going on, I'm going to move over a little bit and run out of space. I have to pull and push and fetch things because there is no ongoing, really, background synchronization going on. I have to do the things. So let's, let's say, for example, I actually made a change up here. Let's say up here, I went and made a change directly. I did this. And so now this main and head, well, they actually moved over to now point to that. And we can do that. Okay, so let's jump over. And one of the cool things, I could actually go into the file, test file. I can actually edit in here. Ooh, line four from GitHub. And notice it lets me do commit changes, extended descriptions, commit it directly to the main branch, go. So now what's happened is this is actually in advance of my local copy. Now, if I do a get graph, Notice, so what actually, there's some interesting things going on with the new version of Git. It actually, Origin knows, knows it went ahead. It seems like every couple of minutes there is some kind of little syncing. So what I would now need to do, if I actually wanted that information, I can do a get pull. So a get pull And if I now do a get graph, oh, one word, they now match. So I've now pulled down and essentially merged it 
into my local copy. So if I go back to this picture, what I've done here is git pull. So now I have this as well. And once again, now it moved me over. Now, git pull is actually doing two things. It does a git fetch and it does a git merge. So git fetch is about, hey, telling me what changes have happened. So essentially, I'm saying git pull, but it's really doing kind of a git fetch. And then to move the changes it knew about to merge into my branch, it kind of did a git merge to then move across. So git pull combines two things. Tell me about the status, what it knows or what it has. And then I like that, I want to move my branch along to match it as well. Likewise, if I make a change locally on my machine, well, if I want it to know about it, remember I would have moved my pointers to go up to the remote server, I have to do a git push. So it goes the other way as well. So we can see those. So here, let's go over here. If I quickly, so that's me saying I've got the, the fetch content is on the box. I've merged it together. We can see on the git graph. If I likewise made a change locally, so best practice always pull first to make sure there's not some change on the origin before I make a change. I could then edit the file, line five locally, save that, and then I'll commit that change. So remember that's all locally, get status. Our branch is ahead of origin main, it's telling me you're ahead of the origin, get graph, which show me, hey look, I'm ahead, get push, and they're pushing it up to the remote repo, so get status will now show, hey, I'm in sync, get graph will show they're pointing to the same thing. And likewise, if I change tags, I could do a get push tags. So that's kind of that key point, and if I go and look now, if I was to actually refresh, now it's got my line five locally, it knows about the updates, it has that full history. So all of that is in play, looking good. Okay, sometimes I'm gonna have files that I don't want part of the repo. Remember we have this whole working area idea. I might have log files, I might have debug files, and I might wanna be able to do git add dot and get a dot would add those files to it as well. That's kind of a sad day. It's, I'm gonna have to mess around. I just don't wanna deal with it. So one of the files I can actually create is something called dot git ignore. And anything I put in dot git ignore, git will ignore. Now I would wanna commit git ignore because I want other people to be able to get that and take advantage, but locally on my machine, it won't use that content. It won't try and stage it or do anything like that. So, in my root folder, I'm gonna open, create a file called .gitignore, and I'm gonna say ignore anything star.log, and ignore anything debug star, and save that. Now at this point, I could absolutely add, if I do a git add, and commit, I've added an ignore file. I'll push that remote, and so I should be clean. Let's create a log file, testing, yep. And let's create a file in the debug subfolder, testing. I can see the files are there. Do a get status, I'm clean. 
It's not saying, hey, look, there's a log file or there's stuff in debug. Nope, I'm all good. It's ignoring that content because it's part of my .git ignore file. So now I want to talk about branches. Uh, and what we're going to do is actually start fresh. So let's go up a folder up here. We'll create a file called JL repo. We'll move into that folder. We'll do an init and a status. So nothing in it, it's completely empty. And what I'm going to do is really quickly, I'm just going to create a CSV file. And in that CSV file, I'm just going to create a few lines. So I'm just going to we worry about who they are, their powers. And I'm just going to have a blank line in there. So we've just got two in there. Save it. And I'm good. And I'm going to add that file and commit it. So at this point, what I've done is I've created a new repo. And let's find a, a nice space we're going to work from. So we'll go over here. Okay. So what did I just do? I created a new repo. I have one commit. My first hash. It has a default branch main that points to that commit. And my head pointer, what I'm working on, points to main. That's where we are right now. Now, when I think about working long term on projects, we have this idea of branches. Now, remember, a branch is just a reference to a commit. It's nothing more than that. We've been working with this already. Everything we've done when we commit was to main, that default branch that we specified. But I can have other branches which could reference other commits. This is really important to understand because the branch itself is a great way that we can think about working and doing units of work. The branch has no history. It's really important to wrap your head around. The branch is nothing more than a reference. It's nothing ever more than that. When I create a new branch, it's a new file that points to a certain commit. It's the commits that have the history because they point to the parent. But its ability to kind of point to different commits through different branches Let's us be able to work on different items of work. I might be working on a feature, then I'm working on a bug fix, and I want to be able to jump between what I'm working on. I can track different streams of work. Branches are cheap, they're easy to create, they're easy to delete, and they give me some isolation because I'm moving the commit of that branch. If I'm working on some different thing, my branch is pointing to whatever commit I'm working on. So I'm not being influenced or interfered with other work. And what's very common is when I'm doing a change, I don't do it straight onto main. What I very typically would do is if we think about this idea that we have the main branch, if I'm doing a unit of work, what well, I'm going to go and create, so there's a certain commits on main. I will go and create my own branch where I do my commits and then I bring it back in. I'll merge it into main. Likewise, someone else doing some work, uh, maybe they took a commit off here, they go and do a unit of work, and then they bring it back in. Now, one of the things you can start to see already is, well, hey, look, if we were working on the same files, which would absolutely happen, what if I changed a file here and merged, so brought it back into the main branch, but then I took this previous version and made change, well, you get a merge conflict and you have to resolve them. So there, there's some work involved, which is why there's this idea of trunk-based development. Almost daily, you bring your changes back into the main branch. So you may get conflicts, but you're gonna find them early and often, so they're small and easy to actually resolve. Now, some companies will have like a big feature branch that they actually have sub branches off and then bring it only into main when an entire feature is complete. They might then have bigger merge things to handle with, um, but different companies will use different methodologies. Generally, if I want to do continuous integration, I need to constantly bring my code back in together 
so I can run those integration tests to find a problem and fix it early so I don't get streams of development going off for a really, really long time. Imagine a scenario where I had tons of branches just spinning off that lasted a really long time. And then a month later, I brought them all back together. Well, that, that could be a fairly sad day for the second person because they may have changed a huge amount of work. Now, there are different methodologies. I can kind of try and bring changes in periodically. But more and more companies today have the idea of coming back to this trunk-based development, coming back into main, or at least a common branch that then maybe gets brought into main periodically. But definitely use a branch for everything. If it's a fix, if it's a work in progress, if it's a feature, it might be throwaway, it might be a junk branch. You can use different naming strategies for your branches. But the key part is, as an organization, pick one approach. Maybe I'm bringing it into the main every day. Uh, maybe I have a long feature branch. You may say, well, my code's not ready yet. So what some people will do is use feature flags to kind of hide the functionality, hide the path of that code until it's ready, break it into smaller chunks. So there's that ability to do those things. But you as a company definitely need to make sure you, you think of a strategy. Okay, so let's, let's talk about using a branch then. So as a company, I, I have some strategy to use it. So I need to create a new branch. So I can imagine, hey, I want to create a new branch. I'm just going to call it branch one, which initially will point to the same commit. So I can think about, okay, I want to create a git branch, and I'm going to call it branch, call it anything you want, branch one. So that creates the branch. So let's go and do that. So if we go to our code, all I'm going to do super quick is if I look currently, I've just got my main branch, and the asterisk, the little star, shows me the branch I'm currently on, main. I can see if there's any remote branches, I won't have any. I could look at all of them. I'm going to do get branch, branch one, create a new branch. My get graph shows me, hey, yeah, your pointing head is currently pointing to main, but branch one exists as well. If I list them, yep, there's branch one, main is still the one with the star, that's the one I'm using. I can do checkout. Checkout has now switched me. My head is now pointing to branch one. Now, instead of checkout, there is also the git switch command. The git switch command is preferred because they're trying to separate um, units of functionality and checkout does many different things. So <clears throat> switch is actually a preferred option. You can create and check out in one step with git checkout dash C branch one. So what I've done now is if I look at my, to move my head pointer over, I do get switch or checkout branch one. So that has now moved head essentially to here. It's now pointing to the reference of branch one and that kind of isn't there anymore. So that's all we've done. It's just a new reference. And then we would carry on working as we did before. So if we go and look at our code at this point, I'll make some commits. So, okay, let's check what branch we're on. Okay, I'm on branch one, because it's got the star. <clears throat> let's edit the file. So we open up our file again. Okay, this time let's add in Wonder Woman and we'll save it, and we'll add it. So dash P, I'm just showing off here, will actually show you the chunks of the file that have changed. Do you want to stage this? Yes. Don't really need to know that. Again, that's just me having a bit of fun. And I'm going to commit it. So we've added Wonder Woman, get graph. Now it's now main has stayed where it is, but our branch one has moved ahead. Likewise, we'll edit it again. 
And this time we'll add Barry Allen. Come on, Barry Allen, let's save that. Once again, we'll add it, we'll commit it. And if we look now, branch one is two ahead, but the status is clean. So what we've done now is essentially for branch one is what we're working on. Well, branch one is now had this commit. Then we did another commit. So these pointers here are moving. So that the head and the branch one is going there and here. So my current status is actually branch one and my head is over here. Main is still stayed over there. And I, I can see those things in action. So if we jump back to our code for a second, I can switch over. So if I look, remember my current file system, if I just type out jl.csv, there's Clark, Bruce, Diana, and Barry. If I switch over to main, type it out again, Clark and Barry have gone because I've switched branches. It updates staging and my working area as I switch branches. So I, as a person, could be working on multiple different things it's going to move between them as I work. I can go back to branch one and my work is back again. And my working directory is updated as is my staging. Now branch one at this time, so it essentially is two ahead of main. Now what if I want to actually merge the changes in? It doesn't matter how many commits there are between them. I want to merge the changes together. Now, if I look at my current picture for a second, it's a straight line. I've drawn it kind of downwards just to visualize, but where I am is a direct descendant of main. So to catch main up, to merge in the changes of branch one into main, all I actually have to do is fast forward main to be here. So I can actually do that super, super easy. I can just move main to point to here. And then it would have kind of caught up. I would have merged main into branch one. Because it's direct descendant, there's no complicated other paths. There's no code that has changed on main. I can just move the pointer forwards. So the way we do that is I need to do a merge. But what we can see is, let's check the status again. So right now I'm on branch one, there's nothing to commit. I'm going to switch to main. If I look at the difference between main and branch one, I can see, oh, okay, yep, yeah, there's Diana and Barry Allen have kind of been added to it. I am operating on main. So I switched to main because I want to merge in branch one. It says it's done it. If I do a get graph, main is now pointing to the same commit as branch one. And I can actually look at which ones are merged. Get branch dash dash merge shows me which branches are actually being merged together. So at this time, branch one and main are the same. I don't actually need branch one anymore. I've made the change. I did the item of work. The item of work is complete. I don't keep branches just for the sake of keeping them. There's really no benefit in doing that. So what I could actually do at this point is firstly check it has been merged. So I'd run a get branch dash dash merged. I can just delete branch one. It's not needed. If there was a remote, I can do get push origin dash dash delete branch one. So my get graph will now show no sign that there was ever this other branch. I don't need it. It's not there. So in terms of what we're doing to make this happen, remember, what are the commands we want to do? Well, I'm operating on main, so I get switch main, and I want to bring into it the changes of branch one. Get merge branch one. 
Now this was the fast forward. It could just move the pointer because there was nothing else going on. Sometimes I don't want to. Maybe I want to keep the track that there was this divergence in the history. Now remember, for versions I can use tagging, but I want to, I want to know there was something else that was then brought in. So if I think about that same picture again, I'm not going to draw everything every single time. So we had kind of the main, and then we created the branch. And what I can now do is do something called a no fast forward. Now what that will do is actually create a new commit. If I do no fast forward, it will create a new commit. And this one will actually kind of have almost kind of two parents. So this is, I'm doing the same thing. There's no any, there's no complicated stuff here. It's doing a git merge. Again, I would have done it on main, but I'm saying dash dash no fast forward. And I'm doing it from branch one again. And now the history will look different. It's going to give me a different view of the history because I'm not merging them together in just the fast forward. It's actually going to create a brand new commit. So let's see that one in action. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually reset. So I'm going to do a hard reset back in time, um, just because I kind of want to show you this in action. So there's kind of that, the merge. I'm going to go back in time, so I never made those changes. So I'm now back at my initial version. Note, you can do a, a re-reference -ref log, and it would show me, I could still see the commit IDs. If I did something hideous, I can kind of undo some of this stuff. But all I'm going to do is super quickly, I'm going to create a new branch again, I'm going to switch to it. I'm going to make my changes again to my file. So I want to bring back in again my um, Diana Prince and Barry Allen. I want to do these in two separate commits. So I'm just going to save that one and then add it. And we'll add it, edit it again. We'll add in Barry Allen. Oh, did I forget to commit? Oh, silly me. It doesn't really matter. But I kind of wish I had done the other thing. I must have forget to run the commit. Um, do I just change it one more time? Uh, strength and speed. I'll make one more change, just so I can see two commits, just so it's consistent. All right. There we go. So we're all clean. This time I'm going to switch to main again. I got the same changes, but this time I'm going to do a git merge, no fast forward. I can still see they've merged together, branch one and main, but now my git graph looks different. Here in my git graph, I can see, okay, well, yeah, they made these changes and then they merged it in together. It's a new commit. It didn't just move the pointer, it actually created a whole new commit for this. So it was a, a different type. Now I can still check, hey, yeah, are they merged together? I can still delete the branch, but now the history will still show there was a branch. That's kind of a big difference here. Now what I'm gonna start doing now is, I wanna make it a bit more complicated. Now the scenario of what we're gonna do is, well, we're going to change main as well. We're going to make it now so a scenario is similar to this. But if I think about, okay, we've got our kind of our original main. We're going to go off and make our changes again. And what we're actually going to do is just rewind time a little bit so I don't have to keep editing the file. So this is where we are. What we're going to do this time is on main, we're going to make another change. So now it's not simple. I want to bring these together, but it, it's, it's, it's not a simple thing because I have to combine changes from here and here to create this new commit. So this is called a three-way merge. 
and I might expect to get conflicts. So when I do this, I'm fully expecting, hey, there might be a little bit of work I have to do to kind of fix this and make it how I want it. So if we jump over, so what I'm gonna do is rewind one step. So remember, remember my main is pointing to head. Now also the challenging thing right now is my main pointer kind of has two parents. It comes from these two directions. Now in the past we used a little tilde sign. Now I'm using the up arrow. The up arrow says go back to your first parent. So this is gonna reset hard to update my staging, update my working to my first parent. So now it's like I'm just sitting here. I'm back at this kind of JL Roster CSV. And I just realized I didn't actually mean to delete that branch um, because now I have to, do have to kind of do that work again. So let's recreate the branch one. I was hoping I actually could have avoided that if I'd have been clever, but I wasn't clever. So we'll make the changes for hopefully the last time I ever have to keep retyping these in. So I've gone back. I'll be clever the next time I go back in time, I promise. So we're gonna make the changes again. So we'll save. This time we definitely will add and definitely commit. We'll add it again. We'll save. We'll add. So this is all familiar. This is just operating on branch one. So we're good. And then we're clean. What we're gonna do now though, is we're gonna to switch to main and we're gonna modify the file. Now this time we're gonna add in cyborg. So we're adding in cyborg and we're gonna add it and commit it. So we're in a more interesting situation. So if you look at this, so okay, well, main has got its own change Branch one has got its changes. There is no direct path now to get branch one. We're gonna have conflicts. So we get status, we're clean. I'm gonna merge in branch one. Now what it's gonna do is it's gonna create a file of where there are conflicts and let me edit the file to decide what I want it to do. So I'm gonna do get merge branch one and it's telling me Merge conflict in JLCSV. Automatic merge failed, fix it, and then commit it. Now if I now go and edit the file, it's put in these pointers. So it's showing me these little dash, 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 head, and the change that head has, i.e. my main branch, and it's showing me the changes that are in branch one under this kind of equal sign. Now you need to go through the entire file and find all of these. If I don't fix these and then commit it, it will include these weird lines in my final file, which I do not want. So maybe search for five equal signs to make sure I hit all of these. Now what VS Code does that's nice, it actually lets me just kind of click a button. This is not particularly normal. Normally I would have to go and hey, Okay, so I would delete this line manually. I would delete this, delete that, uh, delete this. I basically make it look at what is the version without the conflicts. So I would go and create that. And then I save it. So it showed me where the conflicts were. I've addressed them. And then I save it. Now, it knows, hey, you're in this unmerged path status. So now I would add it and do the commit. And now I have the merge. I can see the full history still. It's here, but I've merged those things together. So that's kind of a super powerful thing. Now what I actually wanna do, just for a little bit of fun. So before I go any further, let's actually see if this even works. Let's right click on it, use the mouse. So what I want to do is save a picture of this. No, no, it works. So we're going to take a little snip, actually, of what this looks like. There. So we've got this, and what I want to do is actually paste it just next to is that paste. Oh, it's paste. There we go. I want to kind of put it next to it. 
just so that we can see what it looked like when I did that action. Because there's, there's another option. There's also the ability to do something called rebase. Now, that merge thing we just did is super, super important. It really is the keystone of the work you're gonna do. When I'm working in my branch, and I bring it back into the main, I'm gonna have those merge conflicts, so I need to know how to address those. But there are other things I can actually do. There are times I'm working on a branch maybe, and there are changes to main, I wanna bring it back into the branch I'm working on. I wanna rebase my branch on the current version of main. Now I, ca I can't just magically do that. What it has to do is look at the changes I've made and replay them over all of the commits that have happened on main. So I'm gonna get conflicts, but I can do this thing called a rebase. So if I think about what a rebase is gonna do, then we're gonna have a rebase. Essentially think, okay, main had that commit, then I made my branch, change two, change three, okay? Then, on the main branch, someone made another change. When I do a rebase, it's gonna work out what the changes were and replay them. But it's gonna be a new commit. So what it's gonna essentially do is take those out, and it's still my branch, but now my branch is gonna be change five and change hash six. because so it's gonna replay, but it's gonna now replay over that one. So when I look at history, it's gonna look like I created my branch off of that. It's rebasing my branch to instead of being based on there, it's based on here. Now I'm gonna get the merge conflicts if there are things that are conflicting, but I'm addressing it now, so I'm minimizing what those long-term, when I bring it back in, it'll actually be now easy. So when I wanna merge these together now, when I actually come to do that, well guess what I can do? I could actually do a fast forward, because now this has a direct path. It wouldn't actually have to do any kind of complex thing Hey, there is now, oops, a fast forward to actually get to that point. That's what's kind of clever about the rebase. I'm doing the work here in my branch instead of doing the work when I actually come and merge them together. So let's do this. Now, what I am gonna be clever this time, hopefully, and if we look again at kind of our graph, we see that's all complete. I can see I'm merged. I'm not gonna delete any branches or anything like that. I'm gonna reset back one. Now I'm on main, so it's gonna reset my main back to, I added cyborg. So this is the state I'm currently at. But this time I'm gonna operate on branch one. I'm rebasing branch one. That's kind of the key point about all of this. So what I'm gonna do at this point is I'm switching to branch one. My status is everything's clean. I'm gonna rebase off main. Now there's merge conflicts, which we fully expected. So I'm gonna go and edit the file, and it's saying, hey look, these are conflicting. I'll accept, and this time, rather than manually editing it, I can just say, yep, accept them both. That was it replaying, remember, the first change. That was replaying and adding Wonder Woman. So I'll save that. And we can add it. Now I can continue. It wants a commit message. Yep, added Wonder Woman. Good. If I now do my get graph, there's my main and my branch one. So it's, it's now moved ahead. It's now a straight line. So we had that one conflict for the Wonder Woman. I addressed it, but now it's a straight line. If I was to actually type out my file, what would I expect now to see in it? 
well, I've got Victor Stone as well because I'm now based off of main. So now if I look at my status on branch one, I'll switch to main and I merge in branch one. If we look at what's merged, yep, they're merged together. Look at my graph. It's, it's a lot cleaner. So if we now go and take our little screenshot, if this actually works for me. So if we take our snip over here and we paste that in, my history actually looks quite different. By doing that rebase, it was a much simpler merge operation because I could just do a fast forward and it makes it all look a lot cleaner than this. So again, if I had that long term, maybe branch and wanted to bring it in, I can actually do the rebase and good times. I'm actually now um, built off of the latest version of another branch. So the end result is the same file, but I just did it a different way. So that was kind of a key point. Now I would say I've been doing all of these through the get command. Um, there is also, as again, I've been doing the VS Code. If we jump over to VS Code for a second, all of these changes I'm doing, it has this great kind of source control capability here. Like if I was actually changing the file, if I did code jl.csv up here, and speed and smarts, I don't know, and saved it, it actually tells me, hey look, there's a change. Let's shrink this down a bit. Hey look, JL, I could click add here to stage it. Now, it's the same Git repo. My Git status now shows, oh, it's been staged. But I can actually do the commit here. I can hit the little tick to commit. It's prompting me for a message. Um, changed Barry. If I do my get status, it's just doing the git commands for me. There's even uh, a console. I can look at the output, for example, of different things that's going on. And if we look at git, I can see all the commands it's running. So I, it's using that behind the scenes. And the git lens, you see all these little um, blame comments, and there's much more that git lens does. It's a phenomenal tool, really recommend you go and take a look. I'm showing you all this without it, but it will make your life so, so much easier. One comment about that rebase, never ever do it on a public branch. Um, if it's a public branch that other people are using and you rebase, people will hate you. People will hunt you down because you've changed history. They've done all their changes on the original history and you've broken everything. So rebase is fine for you and your individual branch. Never go and do it on someone else's. It's, it's a really bad thing to do. There is a more advanced way to start messing with history. There is an interactive mode. I'm kind of hesitant to go into too much detail on this, but if just quickly, I can actually go and do a, well, A, I can do things like change the last commit message. I can update the files in staging without editing it. But one of the things I can actually do is I can do this dash I. So I'm on this command right here. That gives me an interactive hook. So what I'm saying is git rebase, hit square bracket three says go back three generations. And what this would let me do is essentially, now this is git lens, giving me this nice graphical view. This would let me do things like, well, hey, I could squash. I could squash these two things in together. So now it looks like they're one commit. I could reword different commits. I can do a whole bunch of different things. So I'm just gonna squash the Flash and the Wonder Woman into kind of one commit. Now again, there's a textual version of this. If I just switch to text, I just change the words. It tells me what all the commands are down here I can do. I have all these capabilities. But essentially, if I now kind of save this file, now there might be conflicts that would have to resolve 
And it's showing me, hey, look, do you want to combine these two messages? So I might say, hey, I did Wonder Woman and the Flash. So I'll change the commit message now. Now it's going to create new IDs. Again, remember, we can't mess with time without there being some track. I'll save that. Successfully rebased. So now if I do my get graph, I've got this added Wonder Woman and the Flash. Now I've still got branch one there, which is why I've got this weird thing. If I'd actually gone ahead and deleted branch one, I wouldn't have the kind of all those things hanging out anymore. So that's kind of what I've kind of I can do over there. And in fact, I want to check what was merged. I'm just going to delete branch. It's going to probably complain. So I'm going to do a git branch, a capital D. I'm just going to kill that off. So now I'm back to there. So now you can see they're clean. Hey, it did squash those things together for main. I, I can rewrite that history um, from within there. So there's some cool things I can actually do. But the interactive can be kind of dangerous, so I wouldn't kind of leap into that too much. The last thing I want to cover is a pull request. Because the naming is kind of confusing sometimes. It's kind of like this pull request and what is it doing? And it's really, we're just going to walk through a very simple scenario, really using the code we have already. We're going to base this on the idea that I have my repo. So we have John's repo. And in that repo, I have a series of commits. Actually, let's get rid of that a second. We're going to say I have two commits. Now I've got more than two commits. It doesn't matter. But let's just say there's two commits. And sometimes someone wants to contribute to our work. So let's say we've got Clark. So Clark in his repo can do something called a fork. And when I fork this, I get my own version, my own copy in my repo. That means I have full edit capabilities to it. I can't write things back, but by doing that fork, I now have my own version oops, of that repo. So let's, let's actually walk through this for a second. So firstly, what I need to do is I need to create that John's repo up on the internet. So what we're going to quickly do is actually go back to our git over here. And we're going to create a new repo. So we're going to create a new repo called JL repo. We make it public this time. We're going to make it empty and create repository. So create an empty repo. All I'm going to do now is for my copy that I have locally, we're going to add that repo as the remote and then push to it. That's it. So if we quickly now go and actually look at that again, there's my file. What we are now going to do is as Clark Kent. Clark Kent is going to lo and look at my repo. So there it is. As a completely different user, Clark is going to go and look at my repo. At this point, I'm going to go up to fork up here in the corner. So I'm up here, and I can hit fork. As soon as I hit that, it's forking the repo. And now I'm going to have my own copy, actually, of this repository. So this is my version. Now, the way I would actually use this is, well, I would probably now replicate and clone this down to my local machine where I want to work on this file. So I would probably open up terminal. So I've got a terminal here on my machine. What I'm actually going to do is run a various bunch of commands. So firstly, I'm going to clone it from that machine. So I'll jump over to Clark and we'll do a clone. And it's created a clone. So now I can go into that folder. And there's the file. I now want to make a change to that file. Now, actually, before I do that, let's think about one other thing. 
So if I look at my remotes, my remotes currently is going to actually be, so we could take a look at this, my copy of the repo. So my remote is going to be Clark. But think about John's copy may have changes made. And if I want to contribute to John, if John moves the main ahead, I'm going to need to get those changes as well because John's not going to do a bunch of work if I contribute. So what I might want to do is add an upstream and I'm actually pointing into John's copy of the repo. So I'm adding something called upstream, another remote, to my machine. So now I have my default kind of remote for origin, which is my copy of the repo in GitHub, and I've added John's copy of the repo as well. So what that lets me do is if needed, I could pull down changes from upstream, i.e. John's copy. Now what I want to do is also define my little git graph friendly function. So let's call my little function. If I look at git graph, I can see, hey, I've got the origin main, origin head, fetch. I could do a get fetch from upstream. And now if I look at get graph, I can see the upstream main. So here I know, good, main has not moved ahead in any way. It's kind of all at the same point. I'm kind of good to go. So now I'm gonna, let's make a change. Um, so let's look at the code for a second. And what I want to do, well, I don't want to make it into main. If I made it into main, then John's probably not going to accept that. Instead, what I need to do is actually create a branch, and that'll be the branch that I push, say, hey, do you want to accept this change? So what I will do as Clark is I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to create a branch get branch branch one. I'm going to switch to it. In here, I'm going to make a change. So I'm going to make a change. And I'm just going to change who the flash is. I'm going to say the flash is not Barry Allen. We're going to say it's Wally West. We'll save that. At this point, we've made that change. I'm going to add it to staging, and I'm going to commit it, changed flash to Wally West. So I've made that change, and now what I'll do is I'll push it to origin branch one. So we did a whole bunch of different things right then. So let's think about where we are. So we created a fork. Now on my local machine, I did a clone. So I had those two commits. And this is main. I then created a branch where I have made a change. I have now pushed that branch up to my repo. But this is branch one. This is still main. So that's what we've done. We took a fork of John's repo, cloned it to my local machine, created a branch, made a change, and then pushed the branch up to Clark's repo. Now at this point, I want to say, hey, John, take my change. So what I do is I submit, and if you think about it, this is main, I submit a pull request. I am asking John to pull my branch one change into their main. That's the process that is a pull request. So if we jump back over, and now we go back to Clark, if we go and refresh, we can see, hey, we've got different branches. And notice it's got this, hey, branch one, so I can switch to branch one. 
it gives me things to actually try and help um, to do the various things I might want to do. But notice it's saying branch one is a commit ahead of John the Brit main. Do you want to contribute? And it's saying open a pull request. So it's putting it right kind of there in front of me saying, hey, there are, there are things you might want to be doing here because I, I can see you've got this change. And there's other things I can do. I've got these, the, all the clothes I can do. Compare and pull request it's putting up here. But I'm going to do contribute. I'm going to open a pull request. So here it's telling me what it's going to do. It's saying it's able to merge. They can automatically be merged. It's showing me, hey, the base repo is John the Brit main, and you're trying to push in from Clark, the super jail repo, the, the branch one. So I can write a whole message. Hey, the flash has changed. Made this for you. And then I can say, hey, create pull request. And then it's saying, hey, look, there's no conflicts. It's just kind of sitting there. Only those with actual permission can do this merge. So now me as John in my repo, I can see there's a pull request up here in this tab. I can select it. I can see it's open. Change flash to Wally West. It's telling me, hey, from Clark branch one to main. I can select it. I can see the comment they made. It's telling me there's no conflicts and I have steps I can do. I can merge it, I could squash it and merge it to make it just one commit instead of kind of two. I could rebase. So there's different things that I could do. I could reject it, but I'm gonna be like, yes, okay, this works. Um, sounds good. But I'm just gonna say right now actually, Merge pull request, confirm the merge, and I can add a comment. Sounds good. Now as Clark, it successfully merged and closed. It kind of updated automatically to actually show that. So what it's gone and done at this point is it actually created two. So when it was accepted, yes, it created kind of the three, it copied that over, but then it actually creates a four. That's the actual kind of commit that it brought in. So that's, now there's, there's a fourth commit actually on John's repo. And we can see that. So if I jump back over for a second, so now I'm actually gonna operate as me. So remember, this is on my machine, not Clark. If I do git graph, notice now it's got, it knows the origin main is ahead of me. I can just do get pull, get graph, oh, one word, and I can see. But notice it did two commits. It took the original commit from Clark, but then it did a new commit to actually mark the pull request. So that's my history at this point I have all of that available to me. Now, as Clark, I actually want to do a bit of cleanup because if you think about it, Clark's machine has this branch, but well, hey, there was this whole set of other work done. So I want to fetch from upstream, then I can delete my branch and then I can push it to my copy of the repo. There's a whole bunch of other stuff I probably want to do to actually clean up because my machine, Probably doesn't know all about this. So now on Clark's machine, if I go back to that terminal, let's clear this up. This is where I am. So I want to fetch from upstream. So remember that's John's repo. That's going to know that main has moved. So now I know about this, but I, I don't have all of that stuff. So what I could now do is I could switch to main on my repo, and I can merge in from upstream, i.e. John's main, and notice it says fast forward. It knows it can fast forward because it knows, hey yeah, you're now just a child, you had that extra commit. 
So my git graph would now, hey, show that. My head main now points to the same as upstream main. If I look at the branches that have merged, it knows branch one and main have merged. So I could now delete branch one, don't need it anymore. If I look at my status, well, my copy of the repo doesn't know about this yet. So I could now push it to origin, which remember is Clark's fork of the repo. I'm getting it up to date. Look at the status. And then remotely, I would push the deletion of branch one. So that's Clark's copy. So essentially at this point, everything is back in order. Clark's copy of the repo locally and on my remote, I now have the current status. I might now delete this. Like this might no longer be required. If you think about it, if I created this fork so I could submit a change, do I still need a fork of this? It's now up to date. I'm on the main branch. That other branch is gone. I have successfully completed a pull request. Now, one of the other things you might do when you think about pull requests is actually as John, if I, for example, had my main branch, sometimes we want to protect things. I don't want people submitted directly into main. I want them to actually do pull requests even within the same repo. So I can actually go into settings, branches, and I can actually create branch protection rules. So I could say, hey, you can't just pull into main, you have to do a pull request, um, I require sign commits, and then I can't force push, I can't delete these things, I can't merge these things. This is really a way for me to lock all of this down and actually control branches where I need protection. So this is a very important thing if I want to have kind of this collaborative space, but I want to enforce some kind of processes Using these branch protection rules really will enable me to do that. And so that kind of finished off that whole picture, remember. So we kind of added this upstream, we did the pull, but that was our pull request. So that kind of brought all of those different things, the branches, the fetching, the pushes, all of those things together. Now we covered a lot of stuff. There was, this was a, a busy, busy one, I knew this would be. But it wasn't really that complicated. It took time because we covered a lot of different things. But it, it's fairly logical when you think about what you're doing. It's all these ideas of objects on disks and references that point to things. And I'm moving those around and synchronizing it with another copy so I can collaborate. Hey, the conflicts might happen when I'm bringing things back together. That's okay, we'll get a merge conflict, but do it often so it's not too painful. It's, it's a manageable amount of work. So I hope that was useful, huge amount of work. As always, please, please subscribe and give this a like. Um, I hope this is useful. Go and try this out yourself. You can do all of this yourself. Follow that script file, follow the video, and uh, good luck.